This is off planet radio. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. The website is offplanetradio.com. And uh, we're going to take a journey today into a place of magic, espionage, technology, uh, social engineering. It begins somewhere back in the misty times of antediluvian recorded history in the Old Testament with a figure who was uh, recorded to have walked with God and was no more. He lived 365 years. And uh, somehow or another, we land into the mid-16th century court of Queen Elizabeth I and two historical figures that have been in the shadows of accepted history, John Dee and William Kelly. And the man, John Dee, who is known as the original 007, a spy, a an advisor, uh, a physicist, a scientist, uh, a man of great learning, who in later life decided that he wanted to contact the other side and began to use Enochian magic. That takes us into the era we're at now, the launch of the British Empire, the new Atlantis America, and we're going to talk about John D. The Empire of Angels, Enochian magic, and the occult roots of the modern world. We want to welcome Jason Liu. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. Well, thank you so much for having me. How's it going? It's good, it's good to have you here, man. Um, thank you. It, very interesting um, background that you have. You've published, I guess, what, seven books so far? Yeah, I've lost count at this point. I think it's eight. Uh, okay. Seven or eight <laughs> books, so yeah, something like that. This yeah. is probably, the, this is the biggest and most comprehensive one I've ever Absolutely. done. Absolutely. Yeah, your previous works, uh, I see here, Generation Hex, Ultra Culture, and The Psychic Bible, and you also teach courses on magic and spirituality at a website called magic.me. And you've written for numerous websites, including Boing Boing, Vice News, Motherboard, Esquire Online as well. So uh, you're a young man, but you have quite a journalistic footprint. How did you get started with this? Thank you. Uh, how did I get started? Well, I was, let's see, I mean, I... I I don't ever remember not being started. I don't ever remember not being <laughs> writing. <laughs> so. answer, actually. Yeah. Uh, and certainly not, you know, I, I, I only have spent a brief period of my time not interested in magic. And that was in my early teens when I was too cynical to consider it. But the rest of my life, it's been a full-time pursuit. So um, how did I get started? Well, you know, I was encouraged by, oh, I took journalism classes even beginning in junior high. And I was encouraged by a great English teacher to, really pursue writing as a, as a real thing. And, and that really helped in bringing that talent out. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just been, it's been my whole life. So you uh, love to write and you love what you write about as kind of the perfect center for uh, a writing career. Um, it's I, like, I like to be independent too. I don't like having bosses. So it's good. It's, good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, we're, we're anti-box here completely. So um, it looks like over the years, you've kind of developed a, a place where um, you recognize a sort of an authority on this. Um, in going into this current leg, that's, this is obviously a very big uh, book that you've got out. This is, uh, again, the title of the book. You'll see it on the screen uh, with this podcast. It's called John D. And the Empire of Angels, Enochian Magic and the Occult Roots of the Modern World. It's put out by Inner Traditions, Bear and Company. And it's over 500 pages. It's a big book. It's very annotated and detailed. And quite honestly, you know, in trying to frame an interview for this, I was a little intimidated because every time I visit Dee and Kelly, I find some things that are both interesting and disturbing at the same time about them. 
imagine how I feel <laughs> doing nothing but looking at dealing with that conundrum for yeah. the last three years full time. I mean, there's no easy answers in that at all. And yeah, the book is 560 pages, but you know, <laughs> what you don't see is that I cut a third out before publication. There's a hundred thousand words that were cut just to make it a more concise and, and more streamlined book for publication. I'm surprised the publisher let me get away with the page count that it is now. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a massive topic. It covers 500 years of world history and basically all of the spiritual systems and religions in the world. So all of those things are massive undertakings to understand on their own, let alone the history of science and mathematics and all of that. But to put it all together into one big picture so that we can understand not just this one individual, John D, but so that we can understand the last 500 years of what's been going on behind the curtain of Western civilization. Yeah, I mean, you run into some paradoxes and conundrums and things that don't resolve so easily, but that's, that's what I did. The book itself, by the way, is not just a book. I, it, this is a beautiful book. I wish, you know, in a lot of ways people could take a walk through this, but they can, they can buy the book and, uh, uh, at the end of this broadcast, we'll, we'll, we'll actually right now kick your websites and tell people where they can sure. find the book. That's actually the best way to go. Okay. So yeah, the, the mini site for the book is johnd007.com. So J-O-H-N-D-E-E 007.com because he was the original 007. That was his code name in the British Intelligence Services which is where Ian Fleming got that for James Bond. But you can see the book at that site and you can see excerpts from it. You can see art from it. There's tremendous, you can see podcasts and there's a tremendous amount there to give you a sense of, of what's in the book. So you can kind of do some browsing there. Of course, you can find out more about me at jasonlouv.com and my school for magic is magic.me, but that's magic with a K. So M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E. And that's got, got all my courses on becoming a practicing magician most exciting thing in the universe it is it is it's uh sort of the holy grail of things um i was going to mention the book uh, the graphics are impressive in this book it's beautiful beautiful print craft and it does the book justice and it fleshes it out i spent a couple hours just going through uh the graphics inside the book in the center of the book so it's a magnificent book it's going to be a collector's edition someday i predict Thank you. Yeah. The, well, by the way, the, the first edition sold out within days of it being released. And I believe it's already on the third printing and it's only been out for, I think a month or a little bit over a month now. So yeah. it's going pretty quick, but yeah, I wish I could take credit. Well, I have done a lot of the graphics in there, including the Enochian tables, but I wish I could take credit for all of that. But, you know, I did have 500 years of public domain imagery to draw on of Albrecht Durer and yeah. Gustave Doré and all this stuff. So you got to thank them, you know, so before we delve into the whole thing, um, there's actually a pretty good footprint in history of D. Um, the museums in Great Britain seem to hold a great deal of his writings and artifacts and things like that. So how much of the historical component to this did you find challenging in order to complete the the, the picture of, uh, of Dee and specifically this period when Dee and Kelly were doing the evocations? Well, there were some big challenges, but maybe I should just start with explaining who John Dee was so that yes, we can put those, put those challenges into, into context. So John Dee, or Dr. Dee, as he's often called, was the astrological and scientific advisor to Queen Elizabeth I in the, six, uh, the 16th century. And he was not only the most brilliant scientist in England, but also an intelligence agent and one of, one of the people who helped start the British intelligence services along with Sir Francis Walsingham, in which his code name was 007. And he's a man who dedicated his entire life to trying to understand everything, mathematics, physics, optics, and the occult, all of which he thought were one thing, the understanding the knowledge that would allow him to understand the mind of God. And he's responsible for some incredible things, not least of which is coming up with the phrase, the British Empire, which nobody had said before he had. Of course, he claimed that that phrase had been given to him by an archangel 
or the Archangel Michael in a magical vision. And he really pushed for this idea, the idea that there should be a British empire, that England and the Protestant bloc countries should take control of the new world instead of Spain and the Catholic countries. And that that could be used to open the way for a new era of freedom and spiritual spiritual freedom, political freedom, intellectual freedom, scientific freedom, away from the dominating grasp and dogmatic grasp of the Catholic Church. He's also responsible for laying out the mathematical, optic, and naval, naval technology and specifications that were needed to actually put that into practice to create a British fleet, which was how the British actually created the, the greatest empire the world has ever known was through sea power. He's also responsible for bringing knowledge of higher mathematics to the British public, along with many, many other scientific feats. He's very likely the person that laid the groundwork for the real scientific revolution to occur. It very likely could not have occurred without him. He, he laid the seeds that later manifested as modern, true modern science. But that's only the first 50 years of his life. And after that first 50 years, he took a left turn where he decided that he learned everything there was to possibly learn from the world of men, that he'd read every book that you could read, which was possible at that time, that he had learned from all the, the smartest people in Europe. And he decided that if he was going to get any further knowledge, he would have to do magic to contact angels and that the angels would become his personal tutors and begin instructing him in the knowledge of God, which D thought would be the knowledge that would heal all the divisions in Europe, heal the world, and return the world to global salvation to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ. So this is a very, you know, that's a, that's a pretty intense thing. I like to say that a, a good way to think about this is D was very much the Stephen Hawking of his day, the most respected, the most lauded scientist. So you have to imagine somebody like the late Stephen Hawking saying at the age of 50, you know what, I'm done with mathematical and physical theories. I'm going to spend the next 10 years smoking, D smoking DMT and trying to talk to you. <laughs> That's kind of the deal with D. So that was it. it. The challenge for me was that it's 400, it's now 500 years later almost. Not quite, 450 years or so. And it's very clear to me that D is one of the most influential men in history. Most historians would disagree with me, but my way of thinking is that if D is responsible for the British Empire, if he's responsible for the scientific revolution, if he's responsible for mathematics, if he's responsible for the thinking that went into building America as a place of spiritual freedom, well, then we must be looking at one of the most quietly influential men, maybe in history, but certainly in the last thousand years. Now, my challenge was that he has been relegated to the dustbin of history, and yeah. he has been thrown under the bus. And the reason that is, is because he's so weird, and he's, so, uh, he's not a specialist. So the situation we've ended up in is that although there's so much, there's so much of Dee's own writing, which is amazing, you know, he left such meticulous records, including almost particularly of his occult sessions, thousands of pages of records, but he's been written about at length since. And there have been lots of biographies of D mm -hmm. that have been written by academics coming from the standpoint of mainstream history, mainstream science, and they don't look at his occult stuff at all. They just skip over it, maybe because they're afraid of their own academic careers, their own reputations, were they to take it seriously. On the other hand, there has been a lot of writing about Dee's occult activities by occult writers, but the occult writers focus on that out of context, and they don't put it in the overall context of Dee's scientific career, his intelligence work, his government patronage, what he was actually trying to do in the world. And it's very important to put that in context. So what I realized the more I researched Dee is when you put that nobody with some exceptions has really put those two things together. And when you put them together, it's like a chain reaction. It's like splitting the atom in reverse. We're now, instead of seeing the modern world as chaos and dissolution, and it doesn't yeah. make any sense. Now you see the, the big picture, not just of D, but of what history is, of what magic is, of what the British and American empires are, what, 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 you know, why, 
many of the things that are, we see happening in the news every day are happening. So that's what I, that's what I did. I split the atom in reverse and the result is John D and the empire of angels, not to make it sound like too big of a deal, but you know, <laughs> well, it actually is, well, it actually is a big deal. It's a real big deal, especially when you put it like that. You, it's funny you mentioned this whole concept of the chaos and in the front of the book, you meant that I don't have it in front of me, but you have the Philip Day K Dick quote about the universe contracting back into unitary, completing itself. And what we're seeing as the decay and disorder in reverse is not expansion, but contraction back into a unitary whole, which is a fascinating theory in a lot, on a whole lot of levels. I mean, sociologically in every aspect, um, just our own human grasp of this totality that um, I, I get the sense, and it's the, your book really nails it, that D somehow was not only moving forward and backward in time mentally, but he somehow was able to harness a vision that really pushed this whole, the modern world, just what we're talking about. How did D influence what later became the Rosicrucians and the um, uh, the work of the New Atlantis by by Francis Bacon, which obviously envisioned America and it envisioned the technological era in frankly ghastly detail at times. Right. Well, let me address the first part of that first, which is the going in reverse. That's a bit hard to understand outside of the context, but once you understand the context, it does make perfect sense. And it also helps a lot in thinking about D and how he saw the world and his contemporaries like Francis Bacon and the Rosicrucians who put some of these ideas into practice. So when we think about science today, we think about the narrative of scientific progress, that progress is extending into the future, that we're constantly making mm -hmm. new discoveries about reality that have never been discovered before, and that we're constantly improving our knowledge and that's a pretty, that's been a pretty deep set narrative in Western culture since the enlightenment. Of course, it's not just science, it's politics. It's, it's influenced things like Marxism and uh, lots of other ways of looking at history. The idea that humanity can perfect itself by constantly making experiment in how to better its lot and that we're constantly getting better and our technology is getting better and our science is getting better and so, and so on and so forth. So this is not how D and the, the early scientists saw the world at all. It's not how Isaac Newton saw the world at all. This is a much more modern way of looking at the world. The way that D and his contemporaries saw the world was that it was decaying over time, not progressing. For D, and God was real. The narrative of the Bible was literally real. And so the way that they were looking at the world is that mankind had been perfect at the dawn of history in the Garden of Eden, whether you take that as literal or as a metaphor. Right. And that because of mankind's inherent sinful nature, that mankind, not just individuals, but human culture as a whole is decaying over time. Just like anything in nature, right? Of course, everything in nature. Yeah, second, second law of thermodynamics, I mean, basically entropy. Yeah. Right, right. So for D, when he was interested in scientific knowledge and recovering and learning and getting scientific knowledge, he was not looking into the future of what could be honed by experiment. Of course, that idea hadn't been invented yet. It was Francis Bacon that would begin to develop that. But D, for D, his logic was that if you could get closer to God through prayer and religious activity, then it, and closer, the closer you could get to mankind's spiritual state at the beginning of history, which is really spirituality, it's the quest for enlightenment, right? That if you could become enlightened, well, then you would know the mind of God and you would know everything there is to know because it's all already there. It's just that humanity's fallen. Uh, by its own fault and therefore can't access that perfected mind. So this is what D was doing. And it's why it's why a scientist would do something like engage in contacting angels. That's once you understand his logic, you understand what the logical arc was of progressing from mathematics and physics and optics to angelology and the occult. He, he thought that he was going, he was swimming upstream as it were paddling upstream to the source of all knowledge. 
uh, the source of the Nile, you know. So um, now Francis Bacon and Rosic Rosicrucianism, this idea, this view, this view of seeing the world, the human individual human beings could become enlightened and recover the original knowledge of the universe through individual occult experiment. And it's important that it's individual experiment, not doing what the church says, because the church is as decayed and fallen as any other human authority, but trying to get closer to the angels and the intermediary spirits between man and God. So this idea swept across Europe after Dee's death, very much inspired by Dee's writing and his, his spreading of his ideas when he was traveling in Central Europe with Edward Kelly in the late 1500s. And those ideas came, I would say, out of Dee and Kelly, out of their individual experiments, uh, planted, it took seed in Europe and bore fruit as the Rosicrucian movement, as Freemasonry, as the birth of the Royal Society, mm -hmm. and the beginning of science. And these were, you know, secret societies secret because they had to be secret so the church wouldn't kill them yeah, yeah. You know, d and kelly barely escaped being murdered by the jesuits in europe and the the 30 years war was not very far away of course that's the bloody war between the protestants and catholics that tore europe apart uh, so this was not this wasn't an issue of what websites you visit you know, yeah, it, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't an issue of, you know, looking weird because you read weird books. It's, it's, a, it was a life or death issue. And so they had to establish secret networks like clandestine networks, like the Freemasons in order to spread, um, in order just to have safe places to be free thinkers and say, well, what if we don't have to do what the church says? What if we can actually make experiments into understanding what reality are is, and perhaps even controlling reality and find out for ourselves. And of course, it's those secret networks and that attitude of experimentation that forms the, the, the fertile soil from which modern science emerges. Modern science could not have happened without this because it, it just, that it couldn't. So it also forms the fertile soil that America emerges from because the great dream, as you mentioned, of Francis Bacon, who of course is the inventor of the uh, Baconian method, which would later be refined into the empirical scientific method. Mm -hmm. Francis Bacon and John Dee and the Rosicrucians very much were enamored of the idea that, well, I mean, as you would, they were so sick of having to hide and being persecuted by the church. They became enamored of the idea of, well, what if we can just open the new world as a new continent, as a place where free thinkers can not be afraid of the church, can get, can get away from control. And not just that, but what if the new world could almost be an alchemical experiment to create a perfected humanity, to see how far we can take these ideas without having to be afraid of being burned at the stake. And frankly, that's exactly what happened when you consider that all of the American founding fathers were Freemasons, that the Rosicrucians were very much involved in founding parts of the new world, like Pennsylvania, for instance. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of one of the many reasons why we are where we are because of this almost Star Wars-like rebellion that happened in the 16th and 17th century, without which we wouldn't have had democracy, we would not have had science, we would not have had, but also we wouldn't have had a lot of negative things. So for instance, the shadow of imperialism and the fact that in order to do this, in order to spread Dee's idea of a British empire and American empire, well, it's not like that land wasn't already occupied. And um, a lot of people died as a result yeah. of the British Empire, far more in, Beng uh, in, in Bengal, in India, than ever died under, under Hitler in, in Nazi Germany. So, you know, it's, but that's kind of what you touched on at the beginning of this interview, where, you know, it's like all this stuff is brilliant and disturbing at the same time. It, it, feels, it feels to me, too, like this was the perfect, the perfect storm, so to speak, in terms of history. Because right here in, in, in this period of the mid 1500s, mid to late 1500s, we're kind of at a, Protestantism is still new. It has not embedded itself yet. It is still seen as the underdog historically. Uh, the King James Bible has not been written yet. We have not really encoded Calvinism and all the other movements that came after it. You have Luther, with you know the nailing of the thesis, 
and then the pro the Protestant migration that took place. But at this point in time, you have a slightly weakened Catholic system, and you have the Anglican system that sort of form, formed under Henry VIII, but that's still in flux. And it feels to me like the court of Queen Elizabeth I was so transitional historically, and in terms of the people who populated it, that it was an incubator for exactly what you're talking about. That's right. It was such a, I mean, people were traumatized by this. You, this had not happened before. Now we're used to there being lots of religions and you go to the bookstore and you can find books from every religion in the world yeah. and Buddhism and Hinduism and all this. This was not the case at the time. The idea that the church could split was, you know, it's as traumatizing as a child whose parents are getting divorced who didn't think that could happen. You know, that's kind of yeah, the deal. That's good. very much so. A divorce, the great divorce, yeah. And and much like I think with small children, it was so traumatic. It was one of the reasons it was so traumatic was because people had relied on for so many centuries the idea that the church was the arbiter of truth, mm -hmm. that the church was ordained by God uh, to shepherd human souls. So if the church splits, what what, what you know? What's going on? And so people at this time thought it was the end of the world. Of course, it was at the same time that the Copernican model was advanced. Yeah. Now people are saying like, wait, the, the earth revolves around the sun? What? <laughs> you know? yeah. And the church is splitting and you know, there's, there's plague and there's wars and people are being burned at the stake in the street for what they believe. It was an apocalyptic time. The other thing that it, it's easy to, not, to forget about this time is that Protestantism was the underdog even in England, because what had happened was, uh, what, you know, the, the the straight line of history is that Martin Luther nails up his ninety five theses in Germany. The Protestants break from the Church. Then, of course, Henry the Eighth is persuaded by Anne Boleyn to break from Rome and go to the Protestant side, but all that he really, and that's so that he can get divorced because right. the Pope wouldn't let him get divorced and he wanted a son and, you know, but all that he did, all of the Anglican churches is they basically said, well, we're just going to make our own Catholic church with, and now I'm the head of it. You know, that's it. But there were lots of other Protestant groups in England. So the Anabaptists, the there were so many of them. Let me think about this. Anabaptists, Baptists, yeah. Presbyterians. There were a lot, you know, what we now know as mainstream Protestant denominations. They were crazy cultists at the time. They were similar to like snake handlers or charismatic Christians. And mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. were not well loved by the Anglican Church. The Anglican Church was actually doing everything they could to stamp them out. And they were all engaged in magical or occult activities. Which is and and so they were persecuted in England too, which is why they you know the Puritans had to come to the New World, and why there were so many religious dissenters fled England and then Europe to colonize the New World because they had nothing to lose. But the Ang Anglican Church was really not different from the Catholic Church; it just had a different head. Well, and I get the sense that Dee himself is a product, even theologically, the traditional. Catholic positions to a great deal. It seems like at times he drifted back and forth into closer to orthodoxy. And then he seems to have hit escape velocity again, and he's willing to get weird with it. And he and Kelly kind of just, uh, you know, they go for it. They totally go for it. Right. So you have to imagine somebody coming into the situation, and this is the world as Dee found it. And being so profoundly disturbed that his response essentially was, well, I'm just going to figure out how to contact the angels directly and maybe they'll sort it out. And that's what happened. If you believe that, you know, D certainly believed it. They spent seven years doing occult experiments two to three times a day where they were, they were doing magical rituals and staring into a scrying ball, mm -hmm. having psychedelic visions of angels which transmitted all this elaborate occult system to them called the Nokian magic, which was to be used to facilitate further contact. It transmitted the, what's now known as the Enochian language to them, which the angel said was the angel, the, the language spoken by angels and by humanity before the fall from Eden. And that could be used to directly do magic. And 
the angels didn't stop there. And this is one of the things that I've really brought out in the book that has really never been touched on by occult books on D. Shockingly, it's more shocking than the occult take on D, which is that what the angel, the reason, the context, the reason why the angels delivered this is because they wanted individuals to be able to use it to make direct contact in the world that they, not just Dean Kelly, but everyone, they wanted people to be doing this. Like people have TVs now or computers and they wanted a scrying table, which is the, the, the occult instrument they told Dean Kelly how to build, which was to be used to contact them. They wanted one in every household. And so that people could directly talk to the angels themselves. And the reason they wanted that is because they wanted a one world order they wanted one world religion that would unite all of the religions on the planet, not just healing the split between Catholicism and Protestantism, but also Judaism, Islam, even pagans. And they wanted this to be part of a terrestrial new world order where Elizabeth would, would be head of the entire planet, which is what Dee had already laid out the calculations to do. So the world they wanted was one world empire ruled by Elizabeth terrestrially and ruled by the angels spiritually in preparation for the second coming so that all souls could be basically saved before the end of the world. And that sounds pretty far-fetched, but then when you consider the extent to which the British Empire spread, it ruled over one fourth of the planet at its height and was called, of course, the empire on which the sun never so sets. Nice, yeah. So named because the sun was always up somewhere in its territories. And then if you consider the, the direct inheritor of the, the spiritual and, and political mandate of the British empire is of course the American empire, which we're told is not an empire, but most certainly is an empire uh, is the same and running on the same you know, apocalyptic thinking. Vision, exactly. Yeah. So uh, what's going on there? I think, you know, that's one of the, the clear distinctions you make in this book is you correlate. If you look, certainly since the late 1800s, when we began to see more fundamentalist, apocalyptic versions, fundamentalist, what today would be seen largely as the prophetic movements of fundamental religion, and I know this because that's my background. Um, we reached a place where that inserted itself into the narrative of the country itself in very subtle ways. In my eyes, it kind of reached fruition with Ronald Reagan's administration because Ronald Reagan was driven by this fundamentalist apoc apocalyptic view, which was even dominated by the concept of the rapture and you know, the literal manifestation of the book of Revelation. And what a, pe a lot of people don't understand is that that sits in the subconscious of the collective, even now running as a narrative, even with, with, with Donald Trump, quite frankly. That's because right. We, we're, seeing, we're seeing subtle signs right now. I mean, the placing of um, the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem not a small deal at all. Actually, right. a minor fulfillment of prophecy. It's gigantic. Yeah, it's that's huge. something the angels wanted. That's something Dean Kelly's angels wanted. I'm, maybe you can say more about that, though, because of course I touch on this in my book, and Ronald Reagan and his apocalyptic vision, and then George Bush Jr. and his apocalyptic apocalyptic vision, and Trump. But it sounds like you may have lived through this firsthand. It sounds you were hinting that you had maybe direct experience of that time. Uh, so I'm curious what your what your take well, on yeah, that. I, I did. Experience. That's like I said. I was yeah. That's my background. I was raised in that, and I was in fundamentalist Christian churches at one time. Actually, charismatic churches, which again sparks my interest in the whole Enochian thing, because of the fact that D and Kelly were basically using glossolalia as a means to communicate with angels. An experience that, you know, if you've never had that, you don't, don't understand the intensity of the spiritual involvement that occurs with la the juncture of language and the lapsing of the, the conscious mind and the communication. However, you know, somebody would view that is intense. It's intense on the level of sexuality, quite frankly. And 
I studied apocalyptic literature. I actually did seven years on radio teaching the book of Revelation. So I got very interested in this uh, probably about 10 years ago, looking at Dee and Kelly and realizing that um, they were definitely on to something, that they had intersected some very interesting things. Uh, and, and it was what gratified me so much when I saw your book and I reached out to Manzanita at, at uh, Bear and Company and just said, hey, you know, this is kind of in my wheelhouse. I'd like to, I'd like to do this. Um, so here we are in the 21st century, and we're talking about Dee and Kelly again in, in a big way, in a way that looks real palpable right now. Let's talk a little bit about Enoch and how Enoch comes into this, because as, as I pointed out in the intro, he's a, he's a faint figure in scripture, but he seems to dominate in some sort of spirit that I was never able to put together. The accepted um, Bible itself only really includes a handful of references, probably three major ones. And uh, if you consider the apocryphal books and the extra biblical books and the books of Enoch, including the, the book of Enoch, that came out of uh, Ethiopia. Um, you now have a bigger writ of knowledge about Enoch, but it's still blurry to me how Enoch triangulates into Dee and Kelly and then thrusts itself forward into modern times. So and maybe you can kind of put a bow on that. Yeah. So that's actually a, a point of a lot of confusion. It's something that people. It's it's something that people studying this can get easily thrown off by. Because, well, let's see, let's just back up. I'm glad you asked this, because this is really important to clarify. So Enoch, of course, is a prophet in the Bible who said to have walked with God and was not. Now, now what does this mean Kabbalistically? Okay, he was translated into heaven. He was taken up. He experienced God and was not. What does that mean? Well, it's, he didn't exist anymore, because you don't when you're experiencing that state of consciousness, right? Um, and was not, as the Buddhists say, you know, was not self. So <clears throat> that's my take on it. The not zero, not zero, the Ein Sof in the Kabbalah. So now what, why is Enoch important? So he's mentioned in the Bible. He's mentioned in the apocryphal books of Enoch. So Enoch one and Enoch two, mm -hmm. the books of Enoch relate the story of the watchers uh, who are sometimes called the Anunnaki who are rebel angels who rebel from mm -hmm. God and come to earth to try to teach mankind advanced knowledge, uh, which has mixed results. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, one of the things they, they teach mankind all kinds of stuff, by the way, I believe language is, no, I'm not sure. Oh my gosh. The list that's uh, in the, in the scriptures itself has to do with uh, the forming of weapons, makeup on women. Right, right. That's um, my favorite. They teach that, that's my favorite too. Um, <laughs> basically the angels taught has, us, how to exist in the corporeal world with ornamentation and yet at the same time oddly enough they gave us the weapons of warfare as well you know right. I, there's this phrase in the bible that always jumps out at me that man may know war no more it means that man was taught war at some point huh. so the angels themselves appear to be um the bringers of this warlike concept to humanity that's interesting because you have to think of those as things that advance human intelligence and culture mm -hmm. but of course also divide people well, i mean if you look at weapons if you look at just look at makeup i mean these are things that cause social division and allow human beings to differentiate each other from one another or to yeah. attack each other uh, you know the, the the inherent message of a weapon is that it needs to be used right the human beings aren't one which of course is unity consciousness. That's yeah. the consciousness of the Garden of Eden. How would you, why would you want to hurt another part of yourself if we're all one big thing? You know, so, so a weapon, it's an, the, the danger of a weapon is not the device itself. It's the consciousness that it implies. But so, but here's the, here's the tricky bit, right? Which is how this relates to Dee and Kelly. Uh, it doesn't. What I mean by that is that Dee was inspired by the figure Enoch and the idea of being translated into heaven and making direct contact with the higher spheres. 
Now that he was inspired by, he was fascinated by the books of Enoch. He wanted to get original copies, I believe from Ethiopia, or he may have actually interfaced with Ethiopian magicians and learning some of the material in the book of Enoch. But this was before the angelic sessions. And the important thing to realize here is that Dee never used the phrase Enochian. That was, a, that was a term that was used by later magicians over a hundred years later as a catch-all term for this general genre of writing and of the Enochian sessions because they related it to these ideas of the prophet Enoch and the book of Enoch. Okay. But the actual angelic sessions are not related to the book of Enoch at all. And D refers to the language as the angelic language or the angelical tongue, but not Enochian. And, and so what you're seeing with the application, and this, is, this has become very confusing, what you're seeing with the use of the word Enochian related to the Enochian sessions is the application. It's, it, there, it's the use of the word to denote a genre and okay. not a class yeah. of beings. And that's, that's as, a, it's, it, as a scriptural genre. And that's important because when you look at Enochian, well, the first thing that people always say is, well, hey, the angels in the book of Enoch are fallen angels. Why would you want to talk to those? Why would you want to do, quote unquote, Enochian magic to talk to fallen angels? Mm -hmm. Well, we're actually talking about two different things because the angels that Dee and Kelly contact, well, they contact all kinds of things. They contact angels, they contact demons. But a lot of the angels and the angels are constantly fighting the demons and trying to exercise the demons from Dee and Kelly's presence. But the angels they're talking to, I mean, they start off talking to the archangels Michael and Gabriel. They talk to uh, the archangel Raphael. And then they do talk to the archangel Uriel, who's only mentioned in the Book of Enoch. So there's, there's one connection, but is also a, an angel that is, is worshipped in the Anglican Church of all places. And I believe in some Orthodox uh, mm -hmm. branches but i could be wrong about that so but then they talk to all these other angels that have names very strange names in the angelic language and the angels that show up are a lot different than you know instead of seeing rosy cheeked carobs they're seeing beings which is a character anyway you know sure not really what angels will we'll just say that that's not really what angels look like that was a uh, contrivance, uh, uh, kind of a sentimentality that was came, I think, out of the Renaissance. Sure, but the angels that Dee and Kelly are seeing are terrifying. They're, they're angels with wings upon wings and and eyes, wings full of eyes, and angels with suns for heads and pillars of brass. Sort of like the Ezekiel thing. It's kind of like uh, very inscrutable. Very well, yes. The book of Ezekiel talks about the wheels and the wings wheels of wheels, of, yeah. wheels of wings. And, and this refers to a specific class of angels called the Ophanim, which Dee and mm -hmm. Kelly do see specifically uh, later, yes. and later on in the sessions. They, most of the angels they're interacting with are low ranking angels, so angels and archangels being at the bottom of the traditional scale of angelology. But as time goes on, they start to interact with all kinds of bizarre beings. And at one point, they even see, a, or Dee sees, a vision of God. And instead of God being an old man in the clouds with a white beard, God is a whale f with, covered with eyes from head to toe. <laughs> <laughs> it's an image that I just love. So we, we kind of have established a baseline that the, the Enochian is just a touchstone. It's a way for us to connect this angelic presence. It's interesting because I see that you had an interview on your website with Timothy Wiley. And I had uh, one, there's one formal interview online. I had numerous conversations with Timothy. It was one of my contentions about it was I really kind of challenged him on why are you talking to angels and why are you talking to even these fallen angels? And of course that went back into where Timothy was with um, the Urantia book and what he believed about his contacts um, it got more complex because the extraterrestrial thing came into play as well with it. But he, I, he challenged me to think differently about spirit contact, specifically angelic contact, in a way that I didn't because I was, I was still shedding my skin from years of fundamental Christianity. Well, Tim, Timothy Wiley is one of the great modern yes, yes. magi, you know, I mean, that guy was out there. I can't even begin to even comprehend where that guy was. Like, it's just like, okay. But we also have to remember that 
you know, Timothy, who I met, I did meet a few times and then I was lucky enough to have that podcast with oh, him before wow. he passed. But he, I mean, Timothy is the guy who coined phrases like ketamine doesn't get good until the hundred thousandth time. <laughs> And he was really into PCP yeah. also. Yeah, he was. And I think we can say now that he's passed. Mm -hmm. So you got to yeah. take that. And Timothy also had a satanic vibe to him. I had yeah, to he say. did. He did. Or a Luciferian vibe or yes. sort. You know, and I think he was probably of a certain level of evolution where that was just funny to him to play with that energy. Yes, he played with it. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was my take on it. But yeah, he was very into the Urantia book and the whole idea of the watchers and the fallen angels. And I have to confess, I haven't. He has like a six book series of his visions which i haven't read i haven't even read a little bit of way too long because there's still one more book that's not been released yet i understand so oh okay yeah, maybe that may come but uh but i actually asked him i will say i asked him about enochian in our podcast because mm -hmm. obviously you know I, I have an interest in that and i said well what do you think of dean kelly and also what do you think of crowley and he said he hadn't engaged in any of that that he just developed his own method and he had a very interesting take on it, which is he said it doesn't have to be that complicated. And he said specifically that he felt that the angels had made it easier over time for people to contact them basically with no furniture or equipment or anything like that, just to do it through the language of meditation and internal quiet mm -hmm. uh, because we need it. <laughs> that was yeah, we do need it. Even in, in, and now more than ever. We need that, that, that inner contact. Um, moving forward, because this segment of the show is winding down real fast, and we're going to kind of shift over to the other side for um, our subscribers. But uh, the wrap-up on the book is largely that, that you have to read this and get the vast expanse of what has happened in 500 years, and where we are in history right now. Because we're in a... I don't care how you parse this. Every day you feel the escalation. You feel the chaos around us. And just based on that, that, that quote from Philip K. Dick, I, I looked at that quote and I don't remember that quote from Dick, but I really, it really got me to thinking about how we process reality right now and how we need to reassess the way we look at things in terms of, of processes. Right. Of time, time itself, which is something I really seriously challenge anymore. Right. The quote is from Vallis, which is from okay. uh, Philip K. Dick's own Gnostic experience, where he believed he'd been directly contacted by the Gnostic Christ, who showed him that the world was an illusion. I love this so much. God bless Philip K. Dick, one of my favorite yeah, writers ever. Philip, Philip K. Dick believed, and I, I think he was right, by the way. I try not to think about it too much, but Philip K. Dick in 1974 in after a long period of methamphetamine use believed that a pink laser had been beamed into his forehead by an extraterrestrial satellite that informed him this is intense informed him that the world that he saw was a holographic illusion created by the roman empire in order to convince people that christ had not come and that we actually live in 70 a.d but that we're living in a virtual reality created by the Roman Empire to make us believe that we're not saved and that Christ did not incarnate. I love that. <laughs> well, definitely, it's, it's, a, it's a perverse thought. It actually, you know, if you think about it, if you look at the memes that circulate on the internet now, seriously, people are challenging, are we living in a simulation? And, you know, based on that quote and based on the work of these masters, I have to I have to say that I've processed that in my way too as being that's entirely possible. What we're looking at here is a whole lot different right. than what well, we think we are. Well, frankly, I mean, just to look at that theologically, if you believe in a supreme being, if you believe in a creator, then you de facto believe that we live in a simulation. Because what is if you believe in a theist universe and not an atheist universe or a non-theist like Buddhist type of universe? If you believe in a theist universe and you believe in a creator, well, then you believe in a creation. What is the creation? It's a reality created by a being. That's exactly right. So there you are. But yeah, the quote from Philip K. Dick in the beginning of the book is something to the effect of, you know, the great secret known by all of the healers and alchemists of the past 
Apollonius of Tyana and Giordano Bruno and people like John yeah. Dee is that time is moving in reverse and that in order to, that, and that, that what we experienced as a progression towards decay, disorder, and chaos is because we're, we're backwards in time. We're, we're backwards oriented towards time. We're, we think that we're progressing forward into the future, but the future is actually the past. And that what these healers and these alchemists learned to do was turn around and swim upstream, as I've mentioned with D, and go back to the source and, and go forward in time, which looks like the past to us, but is actually the future. I think that's actually the perfect place to leave this segment. Um, one more time, give out your websites and where people can find the book. Okay, so the book is called John D and the Empire of Angels. It is, of course, available on Amazon. Uh, you can also find the website for it at johnd007.com. You can find out more about me at jasonlouv.com. That's J-A-S-O-N-L-O-U-V, V is in Victor, dot com. And if you're interested in, in, in practical magic, uh, I have, of course, a site called magic.me where I teach magic. There's a free introductory course that you can get uh, simply through your phone. All you have to do is text the word shaman, S-H-A-M-A-N, to the phone number 44222. When you do that, it'll send you back a text message asking for your email. You put in your email and it will send you seven days of podcasts and guided meditations and an ebook on how to do basic chaos magic and guided, you know, how to cast a magic circle and all kinds of great stuff. So all brought to you by the modern miracle of technology. How's that for a magic trick? And a lot of hard work from our guest, Jason Louv. Uh, that's awesome, man. Okay, we're going to move over to the subscriber side here. And for you folks on uh, YouTube, don't forget to join us, patreon.com forward slash off planet media's Patreon site. Um, for people who want to support and get the uh, full effect, as we like to call it. This is Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. Truth is out there. It's inside you. Keep looking for it. We'll be back very soon. Thank you.